The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. I've got the author of a lot of the uh, work that you're going to see today up on the screen. Joe Warnes and I got involved in this whole subject of uh, disaster-resistant housing about seven years ago when uh, he was hearing from several ICF manufacturers that engineers were telling them you have to use six or seven or eight-inch thick walls. And so Brent's comments this morning about thin walls was exactly where we were going when we did a design, and I did an analysis uh, six years ago, testing a little one-story house with four-inch walls to resist 350 mile an hour winds. And later in the program here, you'll see some of the forces that uh, were generated by that. I've got the website up here, and you'll see it again at the end of my presentation, that uh, Joe has done most of the work he's installed the tremendous amount of research that he's done, and you know, I'll quickly go see through a lot of slides at the front here that are pretty much repeats of what you've seen already today. But if you go to the website, you'll see... You see that ugly face already? I also chaired the state committees for uh, SEAC, all of the main chairs at least one year. So for the first time in history, uh, we have seen a laboratory test of all concrete houses. And that's why I'm up here today to kind of walk you through uh, the challenges that the homes uh, face around this country and other countries of the world, and, and particularly in Guam. Uh, not only earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes, but floods, firestorms. An all concrete house, which we promote, and we're promoters of ICF for reasons that I'll discuss a little more later can resist all of these elements. The performance of an all-concrete house basically uh, is based on the fact that you've got a complete box. When you have the concrete roof, or if it's a two-story concrete second floor and the concrete roof tied to your walls, it just it resists these elements like a strong box. Kind of repeating what I've just said here. Disasters in general, I'm just gonna kind of skip through these to show you what Joe has covered in our website. You've seen better examples, and you'll see some in his too, of the all of the disasters that occur, but some you haven't seen too much of yet are firestorms. Out in the west, we're seeing more and more of those, and it's amazing uh, the amount of property damage, not so much life lost, although there were quite a few lives lost in Berkeley a few years ago, that big uh, firestorm there. But that's an issue too, and again, an all-concrete house is resistant to that kind of an issue. Little chart that he shows, uh, typical uh, wood frame, just the uh, resistance to fire to a Category 5 hurricane, a Richter 8 earthquake, partial resistance there, but a 3 to 5 tornado, really none. Concrete walls with a wood frame roof, fire none. Category 5 hurricane, partial. Richter uh, 8 earthquake, uh, depending on the detailing, partial, and uh, tornado, partial, and again, my question earlier about increasing the codes to resist an EF3 at least, I think is something that's overdue. All concrete building has total resistance to all of these. Just a quick map of the firestorms that uh, have occurred. And you can see the concentration out in the west, so if you want to live out in California, you've got to be careful about where you build your house. So that showed the locations that experienced wildfires greater than 250 acres since 1980. And you'll see this expanded quite a bit more in that website. Floods and storm surges. The red zones, again, they're quite numerous. Kind of surprising that we have quite a lot of that out in California too, especially down in the Los Angeles area. They, when they have a monsoon type storm up in the canyons, those are 
Hard Rock Canyons, a lot of residential has been built up in those canyons and they end up going down the channel. I don't know yet how to design for some types of flood, a tsunami. You look at those videos from the Japanese uh, tsunami a couple of years ago, the debris that was being pushed in and then pulled back out, you get hit twice, you know, first with the flood coming in and then going back out can wipe you out. That's what an earthquake can do. They've got some clever designs in Europe. I don't know where Joe found this thing. Just a listing, and uh, you can look uh, more closely at the website of uh, some of the bigger earthquakes around the world. But surprisingly, I found in that study I did of the, of the little building, an EF5 tornado exhibits five times the force on that building as uh, the strongest earthquake that we would experience in California. But we'll look at that a little more. You've seen a lot of these. This is a chart that Joe developed on the combination of wind speeds and storm surges, and that's become kind of the focus we're concerned about, which you'll see at the end of my presentation. Storm surge does so much more damage, both in Katrina and Sandy. Storm surge uh, more damage than the wind speeds themselves. You've seen these, another type of demonstration of your storm tide and then the wave action. You've seen these. Greensburg, that was a high uh, casualty event in that one too. Even though it's been commented on that the width of track of the EF5 in a tornado is fairly narrow, this and Joplin and Moore, Oklahoma, the track of total damage was pretty wide. A lot of families lost homes, total communities gone. I commented on the five times, uh, four times, that's actually lower than an EF5. Just a demonstration of the uh, wind speeds. You've seen other charts of the number of casualties. You've seen other maps, probably better maps than, than this, although this is showing in a way the numbers. You can look at these more on the website. This was an EF1 up in Flagstaff, Arizona. Does Flagstaff have tornadoes? Yeah, they had one up there. Did a little damage. And this is the crux of where we're coming from. When walls are reinforced concrete and the roof is wood frame, the concrete walls are braced out of plane only at the bottoms and at their ends. If you don't have competent connection between the walls and the wood roof system, and I'll show some forces that I determined for that little one story, for an EF3 or an EF4 or an EF5, and there's, there's some dramatic forces there. But once the roof is gone, now the, the walls become a hazard. The Home Depot that collapsed in Joplin, Missouri, several casualties there when, they, when the roof blew away and the uh, tilt up walls were blown over. That'll happen. And that's, that's a comment too. Uh, if you build a storm shelter within a large box building, move it at least the, the height of the wall away from the wall. If you have tilt up walls, you don't have a competent roof. So we uh, went to work to demonstrate that four inch thick engineered reinforced concrete walls could resist a high wind event, and I've commented on the reason for the concrete roof. So we studied a little 790 square foot residence. It happened that this configuration of one story building was constructed about the same time, a series of them in California, not for resistance, but it turned out that's what we did this study on. At the same time, the houses were constructed replacing housing on Guam that we looked at. So this is a photo one of the houses in California, floor plan, 24 by 33 foot. The 307 miles per hour, that's kind of an odd wind speed. The people that are working at ATC now on that standard that was mentioned earlier, they've indicated that uh, they recommend designing for tornado winds using about 130% of the straight on wind speed pressures you get for a hurricane. So this came from backing down from the 350 mile an hour analysis I did for a tornado wind speed. This would be speed for a hurricane, 307. Configuration, demonstrating the pressures I got from the 350 MPH, and demonstrated that pretty much standard reinforcing, except in a few places where we had windows creating some overturning forces on uh, shear panels. There's the uh, force on that gable wall due to the 350 mile an hour tornado wind, about 53 kips and 11.6 kips due to an 8.1 seismic event. Pressures, 
This is the configuration that I recommend for an ICF uh, concrete roof system with the four panels that uh, create the ribs at say 24 inches. Works very well. Use a ridge beam. These are pressures that I determined, not at that time, but more recently for a uh, presentation Joe and I did last year for the National Hurricane Conference. And unfortunately, the load was left off in the total uplift on the 4x8 sheet up in the box, but it's 10,300 pounds due to the discontinuity pressures, uplift pressures you have at the corner of the building. And the uplift on a wood truss spanning that 24 feet, 24 inches on center, you've got 4,300 pounds uplift. So you have to anchor quite carefully. You look at the RCI recommended the details, and they don't have a detail there for this kind of uplift. 200 miles per hour, that's getting down to maybe an EF4 or bottom uh, level 5. You're still around 4,500 for the hurricane, and for the tornado, you'd be up almost 6,000 pounds on that sheet of plywood. There's an EF3, roughly 2,100 pounds on that sheet of plywood. It takes a lot of nails to hold that sucker on the roof. Once that's gone, the pressure gets in the building, the roof is gone, and then the walls go. We've had quite a laboratory test on this kind of housing on Guam. In 1963, Typhoon uh, Karen blew away most of the housing on the island. So JFK was asked to provide funding for replacing the housing. Kennedy contacted Henry Kaiser and asked him what kind of housing he would build. And uh, of course, he was a concrete contractor, but uh, just he felt that was the best way to go. And he hired a longtime ACI member, Dr. Al Yi, to design the homes. And so thousands of, of these little one-story homes were constructed using precast mountain walls, cast-in-place roof. So Joe, just I'll walk through it quickly. He's got a lot more demonstration of, of why we're studying Guam. And, why uh, Guam is tested so severely. Where it's located over uh, close to the Philippines, and of course we had the, the large events in the Philippines recently. You know, a study of the island itself, and it's got many military bases. That's why the government was asked to rebuild the housing there. So it's a region of the most severe earthquakes, the most intense windstorms, and typhoons over there, they really they're referred to by meteorologists as Pacific hurricanes. That's all they are. They're just a hurricane that rotates in the other direction. Just a quick look at the number of earthquakes that occur there. And since these thousands of homes were built there, there's been a large 8.1 there. But this was the very damaging. And you can see the number of people that were killed or injured in that event, the majority of them in their own home, an 8.1 earthquake. Big one in 1993, an 8.1. No casualties in the homes. Those homes withstood that earthquake fine. There was some damage to larger buildings, hotels, and the like were hammered around some, but those homes came through it fine. So there's a lab test for you on earthquakes. The Guam typhoons, they don't think about an EF5 never hitting them like we do an EF5 tornado here. They know they're going to be hit by typhoons. And Paca, in 1997, raked the island for winds up to 240 miles an hour. That was the highest recorded wind speed when the instruments blew away. They left. But the typhoon raked the island for almost six hours. No damage to those buildings. 240 mile an hour winds. Factor that into the uh, loads that I was showing on the building at 200 miles an hour and 350. For example, uh, wind speeds between typhoons, tornadoes, and hurricanes. You can go to the website to look at that more closely. And Paca was the largest uh, ever recorded. Although the one in the Philippines recently, that was up around 200, I think. It was a bad one. So I've walked you through this already. Uh, Henry Kaiser hired uh, Al Yi to design them. Here's a photo of the thousands of them that were constructed using a four inch thick precast tilt up walls. They put in some very stout rib floor slabs, too, to create the full box. Casting the panels, forms for the roof, casting the roofs. Comment on this uh, slide here that those were not insulated. And they're not really happy over there with the non-insulated walls. They, you know, if ICF had been around, they would have preferred to have been living in homes with ICF construction. Al Yi with some comments. Uh, the name of the houses over there are the dado houses that he designed. 
They're still constructing all concrete homes over there, so this is just a few shots of homes that have been built in years since. Still building thousands of them and almost all of them with all concrete. You know, and not like the little boxes they built initially, these are all good, attractive homes. You've seen this before. You've seen this before. With just four inch walls, as uh, Brent has indicated, you can design them to resist any event that will happen here in the U.S., including an EF5 tornado, which is putting up much more challenge on a home than an earthquake does. He has a lot of information about the construction approach to building with ICFs. These are some details that he had developed. You've seen some of these before. The nice thing about ICF is you, with the cross ties, with the continuous ribbing just inside the insulation on each side, you can attach any finish you want just through attaching. You can see the insulation under the slab and at the outside of the slab to prevent the thermal bridging there. Detail up at the roof, and then you see the insulation panel cut through one of the ribs in the wall system. Beam detail, ridge beam. This is the most recent study. You just saw the presentation on coastal housing. Uh, this is something he and I are just starting to work on. A foundation, grade beam plan. This would be a, basically a contemporary sized house. We just went rectangular, but with ICF, you can build in some curvilinear walls, angles, do something else, but uh, to keep it simple for the structural engineer, me, I, I didn't keep it rectangular, but you probably would need piling under the foundations at the columns, but uh, again, using the, the ribbed ICF panels for the elevated floor system. I didn't show the uh, roof plan. You've seen one of those before, but I've done an analysis even for EF5 tornadoes on this one. It takes some rather healthy columns to handle it this way, but you could resist this with piers as demonstrated in the previous presentation with a little more strength there, but at coastal region, your wind speeds aren't up quite that high and you can handle it with just round columns. You can still infill between the round columns with sacrificial walls if you want to enclose the space as non-inhabited. In conclusion, we feel all concrete, all concrete houses are the best way to resist your highest tornadoes, and I feel that if a person wants security that they can stay in their home in a tornado threat, you don't need a safe room. You can build yourself a safe house. Again, here's the website address if you want to see that.